Introduction and Prologue to Paul the Dauntless. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson. Paul the Dauntless by Basil Joseph Matthews. Introduction and Prologue. Introduction it was at night on the deck of a ship in the eastern mediterranean and watching the masts swing dizzily across the face of the moon that i first had the feeling of really beginning to know paul the stars above were the same that he had watched as he sailed for cyprus on his first adventure there was the lift and fall of the same sea the same splash of water from the plunging bows the same stir of the fresh night breeze that had cooled his temples in a strange intimate way paul seemed to be standing there looking westward over the rail just as he stood with barnabas when they headed for cyprus so during the long journey in paul's footsteps we felt every day that we could see him more clearly we walked in tarsus the city where he was born and saw boys repeating the verses that he learned there with him we watched the tawny river Sidnus run from the white mountains of Taurus through the great plain down to the shimmering sea. From Jerusalem, where, as an undergraduate, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, we followed him to Caesarea, where the foundations of the great Roman citadel in which Paul stood before Felix and Festus still defy the breakers of the Mediterranean, and to damascus where you can still walk under the roman arch through the city wall that led him into the street called straight and watch the tent-maker at work in the bazaar we walked the beach of salamis where he landed on the island of cyprus and watched the sailing boats creep out of the little old harbor at paphos whence he sailed to pamphylia we climbed the glorious gray gorges of the Taurus Mountains and shared with Paul the awful silence and solitude of the Cilician Gates. To do this and to go beyond the Taurus on to the high plateau, and all day, and day after day, to follow in his steps, side by side with the soft-footed camels, from Iconium to Lystra and thence to Derby, westward to Antioch and Pisidia, and on and on to Ephesus, was to begin to understand a little of the matchless power and patience of this hero of the forward tread. Sailing from Smyrna to Athens, the glory of a purple sunset in the Aegean Sea, as it were a glassy sea mingled with fire, the deathless beauty of the Parthenon and all the majesty of the Acropolis, still spread themselves for us as they did long ago for him. Yet more wonderful than the Parthenon itself is the majestic temple of Paul's thought, so lofty, so spacious, so glorious in its beauty and dazzling in its daring. These swift racing, passionate letters of his seemed as though the ink on them was hardly dry, so fresh they were, as we read them on the vast plain of the Galatian cities, in the valley going down to Ephesus, on the great hill over Corinth we stood on the quay at puteoli where he landed in italy and passing along the appian way entered rome with him and walked the corridors of nero's golden house and the forum nor can one tread unmoved the road where paul strode bravely out to the block and sword of the executioner the frightful power of a snow blizzard in the mountain pass over antioch the smiting heat of the blazing sun on the beach at corinth where the blue water has the wiles of a beautiful witch gave us a still deeper reverence for the sturdy dauntless daring of this man who was tossed in tempest drenched with rains and burned in the summer heat smitten with fever robbed stoned beaten and wrecked and still undaunted went on to declare as he ran his race in the stadium of the roman world I press on toward the goal, unto the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This life of Paul the Tarsian has been written after I had taken these journeys personally, and having read books in which the life of Paul, the truth of the book of Acts, and the Pauline authorship of the letters is discussed, and after having studied the life of the Roman Empire round the Mediterranean in the time of Paul and Nero everything stated in the book i believe to be historically true and accurate in detail the life of saul in tarsus for instance is built up of details which must inevitably have happened to a jewish boy living in tarsus at that time 
and from a reconstruction of roman tarsus itself based on reading observation and conversations on the spot but i should have no confidence even then in hoping for this historical accuracy had not dr bartlett of mansfield college oxford read the whole book and given most valuable criticism and suggestion while dr christie of tarsus dr masterman of jerusalem canon hanauer and dr frank mckinnon of damascus dr dodd of conia iconium and miss kathapothekes of athens have contributed priceless assistance with regard to the places where their knowledge is so intimate and authoritative sir william ramsay d c l the greatest of our archaeological authorities has given most generous guidance both in my travel in asia minor and in regard to difficult points in the narrative he has added to these kindnesses by his permission to reproduce a drawing and his chronology of the life of paul dr moffat has kindly permitted extensive quotations from his vivid and authoritative translation of the new testament miss rawle has with great kindness made the index i wish to express gratitude to these and to others who have given notable help particularly the rev w h findlay m a and j shaw griffith m a thus guided we shall in this book try to go in the footsteps of paul it will not be all easy travelling for any of us to journey with this daring explorer of the unseen there is some steep hill climbing some scrambling over boulders long flat tramps over the plain and dangerous sea journeys for any one who will attempt really to follow the life of this man whose eager brain was ever voyaging on strange seas of thought alone but if you will as we sing at school follow up follow up trudge by him till you really know him you will have found for yourself one of the great companions of the world basil matthews whitsuntide 1916 thrice was i beaten with roman rods once was i stoned thrice i suffered shipwreck a night and a day have i been in the deep in journeyings often in perils of rivers in perils of robbers in perils from my race in perils from the gentiles in perils in the city in perils in the wilderness in perils in the sea in perils among false brethren in labor and travail in watchings often in hunger and thirst in fastings often in cold and nakedness the second letter to the corinthians chapter eleven verses twenty five through twenty seven prologue the path of the storks a boy stood one spring morning on the quayside below the great city where he lived his ears and eyes were full of the strange music and color of the life of a busy harbor the sing-song chant of the sailors as they pulled the ropes through the creaking pulleys the swing of bales of goat's hair cloth from the quay and the thud as they dropped into the hold of the ship the discontented grunt of a tawny camel as the stuffed sacks were lifted from the quayside and lashed on his back the splash and gleam of oars in the water as a boat put across the harbor breaking the reflections of ships and masts into a thousand ripples all made him throb with that desire which tingles in a boy as he watches ships go down to the sea the hunger for wider horizons the blind craving for the sting of the salt of the sea and the sight of land at dawn burnt in the boy like a fever a white swiftly passing reflection in the water startled him out of his dream and lifting his oval jewish face he saw strange birds sailing across the blue sky they flew northward from the sea over the harbor and the city of tarsus with slow movements of their great white wings their long necks were stretched forward toward the snow-covered taurus mountain range their still longer legs trailed behind them like the wake of a ship in the sea Arr, now the storks have come there will be no more rain and storm he would hear the sailors say as they scrubbed and tarred their ships bending new sails and reeving fresh rope in the last year's frayed rigging for spring was in the air the great sea which had been closed to the ships through all the stormy winter days was open again and the busy sea life of the mediterranean was to begin again the storks where do they come from where are they flying to why do they go in the springtime the questions which any boy as eager and keen as young saul of tarsus would ask filled his mind as he walked back along the riverside homeward 
The river was running full, for the snows were melting in the mountains and the waters were running into the lake harbor below Tarsus and then out between the banks down to the sparkling sea. At last he reached home, and his bearded father would have to rack his brain for everything that he could remember about the storks. So young Saul learned that the storks came from far, far away south, moved by an inner voice which called them to the mountains and seas of the north. All up the long valley of the Jordan they had flown, and on the edge of the Syrian desert they had halted to feed on the snails, the grasshoppers, and the locusts. When they had rested, rising again heavily in the air, they floated over the orchards and thousand roofs of Damascus, and the white under their black wings reflected the Lebanon snows. Flying on and on, across the gulf and the great plain of Cilicia, they were now over Saul's home in Tarsus itself. Some would stay there and would rest and lay eggs, hatching out in the early summer in their quaint, downy, long-legged young but most of them would fly across Tarsus still northward with tireless wings, rising from the Cilician plain to the hills, and then from the hills to the grim mountain ravines of Taurus, down which the tumbling cascades plunged to join the Sidnus River running through Tarsus to the sea. Over green pine and gray peak, higher and always higher, the storks rose till the narrow rock gateway, the Cilician gates, took them into its shadow, and they came out again in the broader valleys north of the Taurus range. The storks would hear beneath them the sound of running water which filled all the valleys and the slow ting-ting of the bells that swayed with the camels that strode along the winding road. Sometimes the cry of a driver would shatter the quiet, the crack of his whip, and the clatter of horses' hoofs on the stones, as the Roman post rode through the pass, bearing the orders of the emperor to his proconsuls and generals. The storks could not stop, for the inner voice which drove them northward in the spring still burned in them. They passed, and still rising, launched out of the mountains on to the high wind-swept plateau of Anatolia. The great table-land lay in the sunshine, spread out under them from mountain to mountain. And still the great road stretched forward, league upon league, north and west, beyond the reach even of the eyes of the birds. The long, empty reaches of the road were broken here by a line of quiet pilgrim Jews on their way southeast to the hills of Jerusalem, there by a caravan of camels taking wool to Tarsus, and a medley of laden trotting asses. Under the shelter of a hill the homely sheds of a rest-house for the drivers and their beasts made the awful treeless distances less desolate. Below them the storks heard the tramp of Roman legionaries marching out to quell a wild, turbulent tribe that had hung its defiant little village among the Pisidian peaks to the south, and the ring of hammer upon stone where a gang of slaves were laying a stretch of Roman road between Iconium and Lystra. The swift flight of the birds mocked the slow crawl of oxen crossing and recrossing the ploughed land. The bleat of kids and lambs to their mothers, as the flocks of sheep and herds of goats nibbled their way toward the solitary well, came up to the storks as they swept along their unseen path in the air. But the voice within, that had sent them north, would not let the birds pause till a broken coast, dotted with gleaming cities and fringed with foam, lay under their spread of wing. The east was now behind them, they had reached the Aegean Sea. But they could not furl their wings and rest, unspurred by the voice, till the sea and its islands had been crossed and the winds of Macedonia stirred among their breast feathers. The voice that spurred the storks was the voice that spoke in the boy on the harbor side at Tarsus, as he speaks to all boys. The desire to range with the birds had broken out within him. He felt a sting that bids nor sit nor stand, but go the yearning to sail new seas and to feel the mountain road under his feet. So it was to be. The storks had followed that unseen path in the air from south to north, from Nile and Jordan to Danube, through all the ages, as they follow it today. On the great road under them, the road that lies like a bridge from Europe to Asia, Alexander the Great had swept with his swarming armies, creeping over the plain and storming through the Cilician gates, to pour like a river in full flood over the Cilician plain and down through the hills of Syria. Down the same road Cyrus had ridden with his ten thousand, the conquerors of the west seeking to put their heel on the bowed neck of the east. 
up the kingly road on the plateau xerxes had cantered westward the head of the might of persian power the wave of asia breaking vainly on the rocky coast of europe and now in the days of the boy of tarsus the road echoed to the thunders of the legions of rome she the mistress of the world had planted her armies along the road and held the plateau the mountains and the plains by the sea in the grip of her strong hand the boy saul was to feel this same road under his eager feet the blood of the east throbbed in his jewish veins and the pride of birth as a roman citizen burned in his brain while he spoke in the swift speech of greece so he was the child both of the east and west and he was to follow the great path of the storks the road of conquest from judea to damascus and through antioch to tarsus over by the cilician gates and all along that high tableland to the broken aegean coast nor was he to furl the wings of his desire till he had swept across the aegean to face the learning of athens and dare the pride of rome it was to be a very great adventure the life of this boy who stood at the quayside at tarsus watching the storks it was to be more for the kings of the east and the west alexander and cyrus and xerxes who had fought and marched on that road had passed their victories were lost and their empires crumbled but paul's adventure stoned though he was and beaten robbed and imprisoned shipwrecked and slain was to issue in a conquest that would stand when rome had fallen in an empire covering both east and west whose armies would some day march beyond even the path of the storks at the command of a king who was crowned with a crown of thorns end of introduction and prologue